So let's talk about ancient history in terms of computing. There is, a re oops. there is a reason for this. So let's go really, really early days. Every different computer had its own way of actually encoding text. And we didn't actually care about portability between one computer and the next because every computer was custom made. And I mean, they might have one K of memory and storage if you're lucky. And so if you needed to somehow get some data from one computer to another, you'd put it out on punch cards or something, and then you'd write a punch card converter to bring the text in. It really wasn't considered a, a serious issue. And the big thing that the National Science Foundation wanted were out of the linguistics departments that ended up getting pulled into computing was translation from Russian, because of course it was the Cold War, and here's our Russian texts. We don't have enough Russian translators. How do we get that into English? And to a little extent, the opposite way around so that they could you know, flood Russia with propaganda and that sort of thing. And that was really the entire extent of natural language processing probably for about 10 years. And it was dictionary-based approaches of, well, I've got this sentence. I'm going to take each word in English and I'm going to look up what the Russian word for it is. And no, 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 there's a whole bunch of reasons why that doesn't work. In terms of most interesting period of history, um, most interesting project, if you have nothing to do and you're going to binge watch something stupid on Netflix, binge watch that YouTube video. It's only half an hour and it's about the Dartmouth time sharing system. So Dartmouth University got hold of computers through these National Science Foundation activities. And almost everything we do today has some origin in there. So for example, the idea of time sharing. Two people can use a computer at the same time. Prior to Dartmouth, that was this weird concept of how, how, how does that make sense? You know, you, you, you're at the computer, you put the job in and, and the job comes out. How could you have two people do that at the same time? It was also the first reference I can find to something that was not Russian translation. And that was, they believed, and you know, pretty impressively, that every student should learn to use a computer. And so that's why they did things like develop basic, so that there were easy languages for people to learn. And that was every student. So if you went and did classics at Dartmouth and you were learning Latin and Greek, you had time on the computers so that you could learn your Latin declensions and all that sort of stuff that three people in the room know what I'm talking about, where you have to memorize all these different sort of verb forms. And the way they did it is they had the idea of a teletype. So a teleprinter, TTY, some of you might have seen the Linux command TTY to find out what teletype you're on, was basically you have your typewriter keyboard here, you tap away on the keys, and instead of it coming out on a sheet of paper here, it gets sent over a telephone line and comes out on a printer somewhere else. And of course, this was how orders were sent around in the US military for like most of the time after the Second World War. Somebody would sit there and key it in and it would print out somewhere else and the soldier over here would take the print out and you know, do some reading of it. So we had these teletypes. So somebody said, okay, well, let's connect the teletypes up to a computer. And that's how we can have several people accessing the computer at the same time. Long story short, that's why you have a TTY. That's why you have a console that prints stuff out. That's why you have the standard output and so on. And uh, everything you typed in there was using the same encoding as was used in telegrams because, of course, this is hanging off the postal system because the postal system and the telephony system were all kind of mixed in together in most countries. Now, we, let's get to 1961. It's becoming apparent that we need to be able to communicate between different computers. So we needed to standardise, and so hence we have the ASCII standard. And it's really, it's really very cleverly done. This is written out in binary. It's seven bits, of course. Um, and if I can get this around the right way, that's the most significant bits up there. And here are the least significant bits down on the rows. And I mean, remember, we're talking 1961 and we're standardising in 1961, 
and computer hardware was kept around for a lot longer back then because it was so gobsmackingly expensive. So we needed stuff that you could sort of back port to hardware from the 1950s. So have a look at, say, the letter A. Then if you hold the shift key down, that modifies that bit, the second from the top bit, and you get the lowercase a. <coughs> or if you press the control character, then that's negating that top bit, and you get these letters down here. So for example, anybody use Emacs and you go control I means the same as tab? Well, that's because I plus a control character gets you a horizontal tab. Or you've been writing C programs and backslash N to get you the start of something down and across. Yep. And then, as it turns out, control and shift would get you all these sorts of other weird characters here. Or sometimes you'd actually have number sequences, and so you could have a shift on the one to get you the exclamation mark, which is slightly bending the rules a bit, but you're just adding one little bit on the end there. So when you look at this, we've got everything. We've got capital letters, we've got lowercase letters, we've got punctuation, we've got everything that you could possibly want in order to write a text document in the USA. There's also other weird things in here like record separators, there you go, record separator and field separator. So you know when you get a comma separated file and you have the field separators by commas, but then you have the problem of what happens if there's a comma in the field? Well, that was solved in 1961, and we just still haven't adopted it. That's the field separator, record separator, job separator, sorry, file separator, something, something, yeah. Doesn't matter, because nobody uses it. Right, so it's 1964. We have just had ASCII finally standardised, and IBM was part of the standardisation process because IBM was enormous. IBM was bigger than the next seven computer companies put together. The start of the giant mess... IBM decided that the world needed EBCDEC. And EBCDEC is truly the most hideous thing you could possibly imagine. It was based on the format of punch cards, which of course is different to the format of the teletype, telegram stuff. And so you get such odd things like, between the letter A and the letter Z, you get 41. And it's not because they had other letters in there, they just like would do A, B, C, D, and then they go, how about exclamation mark now? question mark, and then D, E, F, G, and so on. And the delightful thing is that due to backward compatibility, that's still how data is stored on AS400s and Z series, if I just pop back a screen here. Quick digression. In Australia, there are six mainframe sites left, like the banks, basically, and one of the insurance companies, I can't remember which, and Telstra. But there's zillions of mid-range. So the AS400, also known as the I series, is an IBM mid-range computer that's very proprietary, very expensive, nobody knows how to use them, and if you don't mind selling your soul completely, either of those two are very interesting career paths in that in about five years' time, the entire cohort of people who knew anything about them will have retired. So, so if you're thinking of working at a job at a bank or insurance company or something like that, then, well, usually the transactional data gets stored in the mainframe. And so you end up having to convert from these EBCDEC formats into something else. There's a program on Linux called DD, which is one of those obscure things that nobody knows about, but lets you convert from EBCDEC to ASCII. Or you can do it on the mainframe. We're now at 1968. This ugly guy here, who is well, the President of the United States at the time, said, we shall make sure that every computer must support ASCII from July 1st. As of July 2nd, IBM said, yeah, right and that was kind of the end of that. It did kind of work in that, you know, I mentioned IBM's bigger than the seven next biggest companies in the 1960s put together. Well, the other companies got together and said, we will use ASCII. Golden rule of text. So the golden rule of text applies as of 1969, just as much as it applies today. If you have a stream of bytes and you are told this is a string, but you don't know how that string was encoded, you have a useless stream of bytes. The only thing you can do with it is, if this is something that a user has given to you, you can send it back to them in exactly the same format. It could be 100 bytes long. That tells you nothing about the length of the string. 
that tells you that it takes 100 bytes to store it in this encoding. But just taking a couple of random examples, it could be UTF-32 encoded, in which case it's 25 characters long, which could mean that it's one of those weirdo emojis where there's a family emoji where you can put the different children into the emoji. So it could be that it's got four of those, so it could be six characters wide. Or it could be an ASCII, in which case it's 100 characters wide. Unless you know the encoding, your program will fail. So this is my vague attempt at making things memorable. You know, no encoding, the code's exploding. You must track what the encoding of your stuff is. Moving on. The rest of Europe had some concerns about this. There's an apocryphal story that says that a general manager at IBM went to the Académie Française, the, the, the French Academy who determines what is the correct spelling in French and what the appropriate words are in French. And, and like, for example, you're not allowed to use the word email in French. You're supposed to say the, 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 the postal, as in like post electronique. Electronic. And so there's the Académie Française determines what is a legitimate French word. And the, the apocryphal story is that IBM went to, to the Académie Française and said, is there any chance that you could get rid of those funny things on top of the, the E's and the funny things on top of the O's and stuff like that? <laughs> now, you know I was talking about stereotypes. Have you ever, like, tried to argue with somebody who's a native-born Frenchman? Yeah, it, they have a certain reputation and, yeah, the apocryphal story is that they said no with a lot of swear words. <laughs> but, um, so what do we do about that? Well, it's 1984 and IBM had managed to wreak a fair amount of havoc. And so they partnered up with Microsoft, who particularly in the 1980s were able to do extraordinary amounts of damage to the, to the world. And they said, well, we've got that eighth bit because ASCII is only seven bits long. So the eighth bit lets us add in all these other letters. So we'll add in, like, uh, you've got ASCII, you've got EPSIDEC. <coughs> we'll add code page 1252, which will have all of these Western European, you know, circumflex and, a, a, depending from your perspective, acute and grave accents and all, all the sort of things that appear in Western Europe. And then in code page 1253, we'll do all the Greek letters. And in code page 1251, we'll do all the Cyrillic letters so we can do Russian and so on through just about every language. And they, they did a few things like they actually didn't get Dutch and Slovene correct. And so when you look at an old document from a computer in the 1980s in Dutch, you'll often see these weird characters sort of circumflex and uh, ac actions that don't actually exist in, in real Dutch. But anyway, so the implication is this, that late 1980s, I'm a Russian user of Word. I have typed my Word document up and I send it to my friend in France. And unless I wrote my document in English, we aren't using a common code page so we can't understand each other. Like it just comes out as gobbledygook. I've been told by my Japanese friends that I pronounced this incorrectly, so please inform me whether I'm getting it right. I think that's called Mojibaki. Is that right? No. no. <laughs> so, yeah, something like that. In Japan, this was a major problem because, like, okay, I mean, back here, if you were in, say, if you're working in Polish, for example, or I'm trying to think of other languages where, uh, like uh, in Yugoslavia, there were simultaneously people who used the Cyrillic alphabet and the Western alphabet, the same sentence. You could write it out in two different character sets and it'll be fine. So in Japan, they had a problem worse than Yugoslavia and it was like six or seven different encodings or different code pages from different vendors. NEC had their thing. I'm trying to remember the other ones. Uh, Fujitsu had another, another set of encodings and, and so on. And so you, it was regularly the case that you would send a document from one Japanese person to the other Japanese person and it would come out looking like this. What's going on? Well, this probably makes sense in some Japanese text encoding, but 
because I don't know what encoding it's in and I've interpreted it as the wrong encoding, I've ended up with a completely different set of letters being displayed. Yeah, so there's a definition for it, you know, the, the garbled text that's the result of a text being decoded using the wrong character encoding. We're now at 1988. We've realised that that was a bad idea, so four years of utter chaos. Unfortunately, those four years corresponded to the rapid growth of PC desktops and establishing how companies did stuff so that you end up with this legacy that had to be compatible with. The ISO organisation came up with the Latin 1 encoding, which was supposed to fix up the things that Microsoft got wrong on code page 1252. And then Microsoft had a turn at completely stuffing things up. They continued to use code page 1252, but said that it was ISO 8859-1, and when you asked some program what it was encoded with, they would say, oh, this was encoded with 8859-1 when it actually wasn't. So going back to the idea, unless you, have, unless you know the encoding correctly, your programs will crash because you'll hit encodings that don't correspond to real letters. And they decided to take it one step further, which is why don't we make up open quotes and close quote characters so that every document is likely to hit one of these weird characters. If I poke around, so there's the ASCII part at the beginning. So if you sort of stare at that very blurrily, you'll see that that one is sort of open quotes like a 66 and that one's close quotes like a 99. So that's in code page 1252, it's not part of 8869-1, which means that every document from that era, you can't trust the encoding. You just have to say, Microsoft told me this, but I'm going to guess that and hope for the best. 